Keep clapping until I put this in. Okay, I'd like the second and third rows to please come up on the stage. Would that be okay? All right, here's my secrets. I feel obligated now to tell secrets. Number one, I always drive in the HOV lane alone. I've been doing it for 10 years. I figure if I get a ticket, it'll pay for itself. It's fine. And then the second thing is like, I got a couple kids, I have three kids, and when my uh, oldest, she was a big kid, I mean, big bone, beautiful fat baby, but when she was like three, she looked like she was like 12. And so, you know, when you fly, what is it, like under two, you get it free, so for your birth certificate. No one's ever heard that, so now you know two secrets. <laughs> Don't blackmail me. Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, all right, Just wake the f up. I can't cuss. My kids watch my talks now, so I can't cuss anymore. So I'm just going to use the word cuss for all cuss words. Is that fine? Okay, hold on. Let me get a little more fashionable. All right, there we go. Thank you. Dr. Jones, the whole time we were talking, I kept thinking Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Dr. Jones, I was like, geez, I don't know. It just was amazing. Like every point you'd say, I'd be like, yeah, Dr. Jones, go. <laughs> go. Like, anyway, thanks. Um, my name's Mark. I uh, co-founded a company called North with a fellow named Kevin Rose. In the past, I used to work at, did design at YouTube, uh, a little bit of Google X on the car that drives by itself, before that, Dig, and a whole bunch of other things. I've done like seven startups, like six of them failed miserably. One was okay, and Google decided to buy it. I'm not sure why, but I'm really happy. And then, uh, and then I left Google last fall for like four years, and now we're doing it again, just because we like to, I don't know, punch ourselves in the balls. So um, I'm a designer, painter, surf a little bit. I love sushi, lo I'm a lover of my family. I'm a high fiver of my friends. Whatever, you already probably read that. OK, so how does this work? I don't even know. Next. Perfect. OK, here's the deal. The last three days, you guys have no idea. The Pacific Ocean got pissed off. Poseidon said, what's going on, man? And basically tried to like slab California off the North American continent, which I know you guys in Omaha, you'd be okay with that, like whatever. <laughs> I get it. Anyway, this, this is a picture from, from Sunday, right? This is down in Mexico. And I wanna share something with you. Something incredible happened on Sunday that's never happened ever, okay? And it's, in my mind, it's phenomenal. And this makes me wanna kinda of throw up. So I'm gonna play it real quick, it's a minute, so don't lose me, I will be back, one minute. Sorry, unless you like mariachi, I love mariachi, but I live like an hour from Mexico, so whatever. Okay, so check this out. So look, I did some Photoshop math on this wave. That's what I'm thinking. This is my estimation on my Photoshop math. I just like superimposed Mark Healy. What's, there's, there's two things that are fascinating about this, okay? Number one, it's probably the biggest wave ever paddled into. What's happened in surfing the last five years is people started using jet skis and other means to get into waves, because these waves are going too fast. You can't paddle into them. I'll submit to you what you just saw that's just happened on Sunday. I think it's one of the most like, incredible uh, athletic achievements in sport, which is, you know, I know NBA and NFL players, whatever, but to me, this, this is insane. Another thing that's really interesting to note about this is how technology basically saved his life. 
right after this wave. It took him about 30 minutes to paddle out. As soon as he gets out there, this bomb comes in, he turns and he goes. It's the first wave of a set. So who surfs in here? Do we have surfers in here? Oh, nice, Dr. Jones surfs. Who else surfs? <laughs> tell me your secrets. Who surfs? <laughs> you don't want to tell your wife or something? What, or your husband? Oh, we have like four people? All right, that's... You can wake surf, right? You can wake surf on a boat. Anyway, well, we got to fix that. You all invited in my house. Fifth row, you're invited to my house. You have to all sleep in the same bed, but whatever. It's like pioneer style, we'll be pilgrims. Just big spoon. I can be the big spoon. Okay, anyway, sorry. So here's the deal. The, the other advancement here, so after he took this wave, if you know, if you remember, he jumped, he, he paddled in, and he had to go up in that barrel. It's the only safe place for him, right? He was wearing two life vests, right? And right after this, three more waves came and pummeled him. And, the, and he barely broke the surface. The only reason he broke the surface was because of life vests. Three years ago, he would have died because no one was wearing life vests. No one was being smart about what they were doing. And it's kind of interesting how technology has kind of moved ahead. But mark my words, you just saw history. There's no official measurement yet except for my Photoshop measurement. And that's about it. Um, so. Let's just talk about this. Dr. Jones did give you like the real, like scientific stuff. I'm gonna give you like, I'm sitting on a couch and this is what I think stuff, because I'm in the trenches every day when you're doing a startup. I love myself, then I hate myself, then I love everybody, then I hate everybody. And so um, think, you know, what is your, ask yourself this question, you probably already did because the words came up there. Was, what is your biggest fear? I mean, for me it's drowning, but I mean like, <laughs> And don't, I'm not going to like bears and great whites, clowns, like what, like what is your biggest fear that you fear right now in your life right now? Failure, okay, I mean, gosh, this is like, this is like the most open group, we're just going to start, oh, I'm afraid my wife will see my porn addiction, no. <laughs> for me, I'll tell you, for me, it's, I just, I'm super scared that I won't live up to my fullest potential. And I'm also really scared that I'm never going to find like my true calling, which is crazy. I've been, I've been doing design work for, like, I don't know, like since 96. That's like not even web 1.0. That's like web 0.7 or 0.2. Like, and I still don't feel comfortable, you know? You would think after 20 years I would feel like I could design myself out of paper bag, but it's still hard every time. And so I think that, what are we at? Oh, we, oh okay. So we're, all right, let's go. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Someone said this once. I don't know who. It's been said a few times. Fear is being a fictional experience, appearing real, whatever. There's a lot of different ways to think about it. Um, and when you think about surfing especially, fear can kill you, right? If you're going to go paddle in and you're too scared to actually stand up and drop in, you're going to get really jacked. And in fact, the smart thing to do is just step like just stand up and just do something and take action. And Dr. Jones alluded to this quite a bit. There, and I get it. Look, the first step is always terrifying. You're super scared of doing something, going off on your own, doing your own thing, starting your own company, going and talk to your boss about that raise, uh, you know, whatever, whatever thing you're like afraid of. The, the way to overcome it is just to do something, right? Is to take action. But, I, but you know what, I mean, it's that fear of failure, right? It can take over, it can cripple you, it can paralyze you, and it can keep us making from decision, keep us making really good decisions. But look, fear's not real, okay? It's fake, it's not, I mean, it is real, but it's not real, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, in, it's just in your head. Um, I think we're afraid people laugh at us, right? We're afraid we'll let down our loved ones. I feel like if I fail, will I let down my kids? Will they be bummed at me and laugh at me? I mean but I don't really care actually. I love my kids, but I don't care what they think. And I don't care what anybody thinks. Like even in this talk, you hate this talk? I don't care, except for row five, because when you come to my house, we gotta talk about something. <laughs> I remember, did I invite row five or six? Okay, cool, all right, good. <laughs> look, if you're in row six, you might wanna move to row five right now. Um, look, if people give you crap, because you go off and do your own thing, you want to go be like, you want to raise llamas? Go raise llamas. Who cares? Some people are like, why are you going to raise llamas? You have a promising career as an accountant or a dentist or a doctor. You're like, I don't like that. I want to raise llamas. They're cute. Alpacas, whatever. I don't even know the difference. But here's the deal. 
those people are idiots. They're lame, right? They're, they're, they're just reflecting their own insecurities on you. Don't worry about them. Seriously, don't even stress about them. So just do you, right? I, I don't know how, like, we're, gonna have to, we're doing the dance here between, like, my face and slides. So hopefully it makes sense. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you can't give a flying cuss word about what people think. You really can't. I'm, like, not even kidding. Like, those mother cussers can pound sand. You don't need them in your life. Like, think about it. Bob Dylan goes to American Idol, right? Hey, hey, I'm Bob Dylan. and sing a song. And cussing J-Lo sitting there and be like, oh, you know, it's a little nasally. It was a little off pitch. Sorry, Bob, doesn't really work. There's no way in hell Bob Dylan would make it on American Idol. There's no way. He doesn't care. He just did him. Johnny Cash, same way. Johnny Cash didn't even sing. Dude just like talked into a mic. <laughs> He's one of the greatest musicians of all time. So we love music in our family. We're, we're big. We always play in the Sonos. Dave Grohl's, a, a, you know, we, we love Dave Grohl. Dave, you know, not a personal friend, but we still love him. He, this is killer. He's probably one of the greatest drummers of all time, I think, personally. And he said this quote, he, he basically said, look, I never took lessons on how to play the guitar. I never took lessons on how to play the drums. I was like, really? Really? What? Your mom didn't like, you didn't have some like tiger mom? Like, Dave, get on the drums four hours a day. No, this dude just figured it out. He was interested in it. He was interested in music. He just figured it out. Oh, thank goodness for box water. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Thank you, box water, for sponsoring Big Omaha. I think you're a sponsor. I got it for free. So anyway, <laughs> I meet people all the time like, oh, dude, I want to do a startup. And I'm like, OK, cool. Like, tell me your idea. They tell me the idea. Where do I find a designer? Where, if I, where do I find an engineer? I'm like, I mean, I don't know. Do you not know anything about design or engineering? No, not really. I'm like, OK, well, Photoshop's going to take a while to learn. So I just bust out a pen and paper and like draw me your idea. Oh, can I just find someone to do that? I'm like, look, man, if you want to start a rock band, you got to learn how to write some music or at least play the guitar or the drums or sing. Like, give me something here. You can't just, like, want to do something. It's like a baker. Or it's like, you, like say you have, like, a sweet tooth. You're like, man, I just love cookies. And you think, all right, I'm going to go be a baker now. Well, guess what? Being a baker is hard. you got to, like, burn yourself a couple times, figure out ingredients, whatever. And it just, it, it like, kind of blows my mind when people want to, they want to do these things. Right? They, they've asked themselves, you know, what are they afraid of? And they've kind of confronted that. I'm afraid of starting a new gig. But then they go try to do a new gig. And they're, and they, but you've got to Dave Grohl it. You've got to figure it out. You've got to put in the time. God knows how many hours Dave put into learning the drums and the guitar. He was probably terrible, actually. He was probably banging on stuff for a while. And you're going to be terrible. And that's OK. You're going to blow it for years, probably. But it doesn't matter. You'll figure it out. Remember, like, don't care about what people think. OK. So that's that point. Figure it out. And like. What's really interesting about this is you're going to do things your way. You're not going to do it Dr. Jones's way. You're not going to do it my way or any Brad Feld's way or anyone else who comes up here today. We've all done things our own way. We've read blog. You know, we've done the best we can. You're your own deal. You've got your own deal, right? So everything you read online, everything that people say, that's their own experience, their own perspective. You have to create your own reality. You have to figure it out for yourself, all right? Don't, and if you think a certain way, that's killer. Like, embrace that and, like, marry that. So we're going to do a little, like, what is it called? When I show you visual things and then you learn from them, it's, I don't know, Dr. Jones has a name for it, I'm sure. So these are people that I think just figured it out. They blaze their own trail. They don't give a flying cuss word about what anyone thinks. Okay? So we're going to roll with, we got a couple of Omahans in, in this slide. So here we go. Am I right? Am I right? All right. No more, no more said. That's Lady Gaga. It's not the best picture of her. It's one I could find. <laughs> this guy? I don't even know. Like, at some point, I don't know. Who knows what else he's going to make? But how crazy. They're laying in rocket ships on boats. They're electrifying your house. Right? Bossy pants. Who read that? Good book. I'm not even a woman, but I read that book. I wanted to be a woman so I could, like, lean in and just be <laughs> awesome. Really inspiring. She didn't write Lean In. That's someone else. We'll get to her. Come on. So great. The way better fight than Mary Field Pocky. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Who watched that fight? OK. Alan Turing. Alan Turing. If you didn't see Imitation Game, you should check that movie out. Really good. Quite well. Quite good. Here's our Lean In, Miss Sandberg. 
quick moment, her husband passed away recently, very, very, very just out of the blue. And a, fr a friend of ours at Google also died in that uh, Everest thing. And I got to tell you, man, that's, that makes you pause. That makes you think about why the hell are you doing something you hate in your job? You don't know what will happen. This dude, her husband was like 47. That's it. But Ted, that's, that's what I'm scared of. I'm so scared that I'm going to, that, anyway, you get the point. We don't have to belabor it. But anyway, much respect to them. A little Omaha love, Malcolm X from Omaha. I don't know whether clap for, I don't, like, I don't know what the PC thing is. Like, do you clap for Malcolm X? You don't. I don't know how people judge about that. But, but he, he did his own jam. He figured out his own way. He did, there was no rules, right? When he was around and he wanted to get his message out, he did it in his own way. Who knows who this is? Brittany Howard, Alabama Shakes. Talk about someone who sings her own way. Talk about someone who has a very unique voice. She'd get, she wouldn't, I don't think she'd make it on American Idol or The Voice, you know? She does her own thing. It's beautiful. This guy's probably <laughs> failed more companies. He's probably, he's like, I don't know. If you go to Virgin's website, they have like Virgin for everything. There's like 40 companies. There's like Virgin for chairs and Virgin for box water, you know? <laughs> One of the greatest surfers of all time. Um, he also just kind of paved his own way. This guy, of course, uh, the next one's really awesome. You... Um, another Omahaan, Mr. Buffett. Where, I want to see his house. If someone could take me there, it'd be great. Spike Lee, you know, they just had that movie Selma come out. It didn't win any Academy Awards, no Oscar. I think there were some nominations, but what a crime. That movie was incredible. Someone else who's kind of done their own jam. This good movie about him. He's really smart. And probably the person I think epitomizes this. This guy's great. This guy doesn't get, he doesn't even care anymore. He's just like walking around, hair's like all crazy. This guy does not care, right? Um, here, like, and for me personally, it took me a while to figure this out. I mean, my degree was in accounting information systems, for crying out loud. I didn't go to Carnegie Mellon and get a master's of HCI. I didn't get an art degree or anything I wish I had. It would have been really cool. But I didn't. I went to college and I, think, and I felt like, OK, I have to get a job. The only thing really that pays money is like boring stuff. So no offense to accountants. It's like, if you're into it, man, if that's your jam, I hope you have freaking accounting nirvana, like that you just kill it with accounting. But for me, I was always doing design work. I was always helping people with their websites and always doing this kind of stuff on the side. So I was like, oh, I guess I'm supposed to be a designer. All right, we're going to get super philosophical for a second, so put that hat on for a second. Okay. I know we're not Bible Belt. We're like fringy Bible Belt. So this guy, if you don't know who this is, this is, this is Thomas Merton. He was an American Catholic writer, poet, social activist. He was really big into, like, all religions should talk to each other, which I think is a really good idea. He said this, what you fear is an indication of what you seek. So think about that. What you fear is an indication. It's like this signal, right? It's like this, like... I was at Google, I was eating free food, I was getting paid a lot of money, I had like stock that they would just give you. It's like that Silicon Valley show where the guys are like sitting on the roof drinking. That's what it's like. You're just like, are we getting paid? We, you know, you're not working that hard. It's not stressful. Um, I mean, it is kind of hard. But I was terrified of leaving and doing another startup because like, now, we, we had one before and it did okay, so now I felt like, oh, are people gonna judge me? And like, what's the next app you guys are gonna build? What, I dig after dig, Kevin Rose, what are you gonna do next? And it's like, I'm like, I mean, I, I don't know. What if we build something stupid and everybody hates it and then they hate us and oh, all these things. Um, but that fear, I knew I had to confront it. I was scared of starting, so I was like, cuss it. I, I gotta go do it. I'm trying. I can't have any F words. It's really, we can't edit them out. All right, let's go more religious stuff. This is kind of fun. This isn't like scripture. This is like the Gnostic scriptures, which I guess is like not real. So sorry if you're like hardcore. We're going a little fringe. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, I love this quote. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. But if you deny it, right, if you don't bring it forth, it'll kill you. I just paraphrased. What you do not bring forth will destroy you. But like modern day language says, you have that thing inside of you, you know it's in there. You want those llamas. You love those llamas. 
you want to be a stamp collector, whatever it is, like you got your jam, it's inside of you, but you're so scared of letting that thing out because it's going to burst forth. You have to, or it's going to kill you. It's going to eat you alive. I'm serious, man. I'm dead serious. I started painting a while ago because just I had all these things I wanted to paint. And uh, I didn't, I should have put it in here, but I hold the record for the uh, most unattended, most remote art show in America. It was in, <laughs> it was in Darwin, California. It was great. I wish row seven would have showed up. Um, have you ever, but think about this. Have you had a period in your life where like you were so stoked, like you couldn't sleep. Like this was me last night. I was so stoked. I couldn't sleep because of coming here. But like you leap out of bed, right? You leap out of bed. You, you just are so happy to go to work or do whatever you're about to do. I mean, I've had those moments. They're fleeting. But once you have that feeling, it's like crack. Like you want to get back to that. You don't, you're not thinking about time doesn't even exist really anymore. And, and that's what it's like when you kind of find your true calling, right? And you find the thing that you really want to do. I think that people are happiest and they're most fulfilled when they're meeting that challenge of their true calling. When they've kind of figured out, they've confronted that fear, and, and they're just going for it. Now, we just saw a bunch of people who have lived great lives. And I think, I think the problem is we compare ourselves to that. But screw them. Like, you don't need to be like Prince. Prince is Prince. You're not Prince. You're you. You. You're, are, you are not Prince. I'm not Prince. You're you. And it's like, you may have some recluse living to you, like stamp collecting, right? And that stamp collector, you may think, like, I don't know, he's weird, he's a stamp collector. But who, don't judge that guy. You have no idea. He may be the greatest stamp collector the world has ever known. And he may be in there just, like, again, he is in stamp, like, heaven. And he's killing it. And he is, like, the number, he's the happiest person ever alive. Right? And that's it. That's fine. It's an, you may say that's an ordinary life. It's not a great life. But that ordinary life that he has is happy. And it's amazing. And it's incredible. I'm just showing pictures as I talk because I heard it keeps your attention. So, <laughs> and listen, listen to this. Your calling doesn't have to be dramatic, right? Your calling doesn't have to be dramatic. My wife's a stay-at-home mom. I think it's pretty dramatic, actually. But that's, to her, that's her calling. She loves it. She loves it, man. She thinks it's the greatest thing ever. And like, that's it. That's okay. And she's so happy. And you're, you're, you may think you're living like an ordinary life, that you're doing something that's not like this great epic thing, but you're happy. That's cool. Celebrate that. Like, own that, right? I want to share, this is a little, now we're going to get a little controversial. Don't hate me on the Twitters. Well, I don't want to get in a Twitter fight here. But people always say, and I think it's a half truth. There's some truth in this, but I think it's kind of BS. You ever hear people say this? Oh, you can do anything you want to do. You can do anything you want to do. I don't think so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you can't be anyone you want to be. You can only be you. Can only be you. That's it. But what's cool about being you is you have kind of endless possibilities with inside yourself and endless things that, that you personally can do. But it's, but it's really, really important for you to find what that actually is for yourself. I love this quote. We're going to go back to our friend Thomas Merton. Every man or woman, he was old, was old school, right? Black and white picture. So he, he didn't know how to PC his quotes yet. We'll say this. Every person has a vocation to be someone he or she must understand clearly that in order to fulfill his vocation, he can only be one person himself, right? And I've tried this, man. I have tried, like I said, I was an accounting major. I did design for a while. I left. I tried to do real estate for a year or two. I ran a skilled nursing facility for four months. Do you know, I did it because I thought it would, I wanted to make money. I thought it would make money. I was miserable. I hated it. I love old people, but I hated that job. <laughs> I was sitting there one night, and this beautiful Hispanic family rolls in. They roll their daughter in. She's in a, she's in a wheelchair, G-tube. She's 26. She was hit by a drunk driver. This family was on welfare. And the mom and the dad are crying, begging me, this young kid who somehow is running this facility, to take their kid in. And I'm only doing, I'm on the job. This is my fourth month on the job, by the way. And, and she's like, please, you know, do you have any room at the end? Like, can you take my daughter? And, and I'm in my mind, I'm like listening to my nurses yell at me because I brought this patient in who is like, can't eat, she can't move, they're, she's going to take up a ton of their time. 
I, get, I can see my boss yelling at me because she's not Medicare, we're not going to be able to pay for her because the state doesn't pay enough money, all the stupid things. By the way, if you're doing healthcare stuff, healthcare startups, God bless you, that is a nightmare I would, don't want any part of. <laughs> but I had to look this family in the eye and I, had to t and I had to tell them, no, we don't have any room, which was a lie. We had like 30 beds. We had 30 beds in the room, but we were saving them for different patients, Medicare patients. And I walked in the next day and I quit because I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't figure out how to separate myself from the people. I don't tell you that story to put, you, put myself, like say, oh, you know, made the right decision, whatever. In fact, I was like super, I quit without a job. My wife was super pissed and then I had to go back to designing. So it was a good decision. Anyway, my point is that like, I chased something for money and it was so, it was not happy. It was not satisfactory at all. And I was lying to myself and struggling with that all the time. Okay, we'll go back. Let's go back to waves. Let's go back to the ocean. Who's seen this picture before? Yeah? Do you know when it was made? Anyone know? Hmm? 1530? Close. It was like 1830, a few, a few hundred centuries off. But <laughs> it's okay. This is called the Great Wave of Kanazawa. And I have to look at it because like, I don't, I'm going to screw up these words. I'm sorry. And my wife's a quarter Japanese, so I should know how to say this stuff. But check it out. Look at this. Look at the waves. Now, a little art history. Look at how the waves move. And the reason they do is because he's taken Mount Fuji in the back, this unmovable mountain, and just smacked it right back, right back there. I love this piece. If you ever get a chance, it's in New York. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's beautiful. And it's really incredible, and the way it captures motion. The man who painted this was this dude, Katsushika Hokusai. He painted that when he was 60 years old. Right? Okay? And he, he said that when he painted that, basically, he, this, is, this is a direct quote, I'm going to read it. He said, I became an artist and from 50 on began producing works that got some reputation, but nothing I did before the age of 70 was even worth any attention. <laughs> he went on to say, if I go on trying, you know, maybe at some point, maybe when I'm like 86, I might be able to do some, you know, get, capture the spirit of beasts and insects and fish. And maybe if I can live to about 130 or 140, maybe then I can get every stroke to matter and every blotch of paint to matter. And I'm paraphrasing a ton and probably destroying his quote, which probably sounds amazing. But that, that quality, that ability, that commitment, he found his true calling. And he's put his whole heart into it. I, he doesn't give a crap. He has no idea this is in the New York. He didn't paint this to be in some fancy museum. He just did it out of his soul. I learned design from this guy. This is Hugh McGee. Hugh has no idea I put his picture in this presentation, by the way. Hugh, my mom, my mom introduced me to Hugh, and he's the guy who taught me Photoshop. He's the guy who sat me down. He had this design marketing firm in Northern Virginia where I grew up. I knew nothing, and he kind of brought me under his wing. And this, this is a pretty neat, neat person. All during the day, we would get people walking in uh, from Narcotics Anonymous. He was a sponsor. And most of the day, he would be talking to people, helping them through their life. And while I'm over there like doing all the work and getting paid like $8 an hour, I'm like, hey, dude, I know you're like doing some good stuff, but I need some help. He taught me two things that have always stuck with me. Number one, that design is always emotional. It's always emotional. And we, you know, working at YouTube and Google, we have to use data to like make decisions, but get, make no mistake. Great design is pure, is pure emotion. And the best designers, I think, kind of understand that and how we, how we react to things. The other thing he taught me, well, he didn't teach me, he would pose this question to me all the time. And I never understood, <laughs> it took me forever to understand this, this question. He'd always ask me, like every day, Mark, what are you pretending not to know? I'm like, well, I don't know Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you don't work and help me and make me do all the work. But this question is so powerful. Think about it for a moment. What are you pretending not to know? Let me give you some examples to kind of spur your brain. Um, like pretending not to know you're in debt. So you go out on the weekend, you spend a bunch of money, you overspend on drinks and dinner and everything. You're pretending not to know that you're in debt. You shouldn't do that. You're just pretending not to know. Pretending not to know you're in a bad relationship. You just pretend not to know. You go out anyway and you have this relationship. You just pretend not to know. Um, what are some other ones I had on here? Pretending not to know you hurt someone's feelings. You know you did. You feel it. You feel that little voice inside of you, but you just pretend not to know and you ignore it. Um, pretending not to know you're in a dead-end gig or you're working in a nursing home that you hate. Our fears keep us from knowing the truth 
about ourselves and about our situation. You know, it's fear that kind of keeps you from kind of confronting those things. So ask yourself that question, you know, what are you personally pretending not to know? And, you know, just be courageous and, and confront those things. Stop telling the little white lies. Stop throwing shade at people. Um, and I think after you face your fears and you kind of find that true calling, then, then I think you'll find some happiness. Because it's not money, all right? It's not money. I know it's so cliche to sound. Like even Dave Grohl, he got interviewed. Like, so Dave, you know, tell us about your thing. He's like, oh, it's about the music band. And, and Anderson Cooper was interviewing him. And was like, Dave, you like sell out stadiums. Like, that's really dumb for you to say. Like, that's the easiest thing for you to say. It's all about the music. You have millions. And he said, look, when I made the band Foo Fighters, first of all, the name is terrible. Had I known we'd be sticking around for a month and a half, I wouldn't even call it Foo Fighters. He's like, we made, we just were making songs. We didn't even know if they were good. We didn't go to a fancy anything. And I think when you find that you're calling, you're kind of in that jam, you, you aren't going to be focused on the money. It will come, for crying out loud. You'll figure it out, llama farmers and stamp collectors of the world. You'll figure it out. I have to give you some, all right, I'm almost done. I think I see, like, lights flashing. Okay. So, look, three more tips, okay, that I love. That I, they, they're, like, totally orthogonal, so I apologize. Everyone's job is hard, Okay. Everybody, the person who helped you this morning in the hotel, the person who opened the door for you, the, the folks here volunteering, the folks you know, doing this camera right now, it's killer. Everyone's job is hard, right? If you, if you understand that and you can like, appreciate that and empathize with everybody, it'll go a long way. Do the things you know you should be doing. That little voice in your head. There's a great book called Leadership and Self-Deception. Highly recommend it. Quick story. Husband gets home. He's, blah, he's so tired goes to bed, sweet wife's next to him, they have a brand new baby, it's like two in the morning, baby starts crying, husband's sitting there, he has a thought, you know, she's sleeping, she's wonderful, I should get up and take care of the baby. Guess what? He doesn't. He doesn't do it. He just sits there, he's like, what the cost, man? He like starts elbowing his wife. I've been working all day, I've been like bringing home the bacon, you're like staying home all day, eating bonbons on the couch, like why is she getting up? And he starts building up this justification for why he didn't follow what he knows he should have done. And now this beautiful, sweet, nice person next to him is like, he's like, creates this problem. He's like, get up, get the baby, ah! And he causes conflict, because he didn't, he just didn't do what he should have done. And he's throwing blame on people. And we can have a whole conversation about blame and all this other fun stuff. And like, here's my last piece of advice, and I'm like dead serious, I live by this, and we have it in our Slack channel all the time. By the way, if you're on like email and Photoshop, that's like, that's cool, it's like 2013. Get on like Slack and Sketch. That's my only design e thing for you to say. Is this it, man? Drink water. <laughs> Just drink a lot of water. Because like honestly, I think like half the wars and stuff happen because people drink it out of the box. Because I think half the world is just dehydrated. And if you're in a meeting with someone all pissed off, just be like, bro, have some water and calm down. <laughs> we'll figure it out. And that's it. Thanks very much. Oh, yeah. This We do Q&A. Two questions. You guys are fun. You guys are fun. All right. I, they said I can do two questions. We have two minutes and 30 seconds. Ready? Two questions. But I can't see really that well. And if there's no questions, that's okay, too. Wow. Easy. All right. Done. Oh, you're going to hit me? Come at me, bro. <laughs> What's that thing like? You so just, just tell us something about this startup that you've done. That oh, you, sold you want to, to about Google? my startup? Yeah. You don't want to know about that. That's dumb. Everybody is going to talk about that stuff. I'll tell you later. Yeah, yeah. I was, our, yeah. We can talk. We don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about your startup. Hey, yes. So uh, yeah. you talked a lot about fear. So what, um, in terms of next steps and where you're going after today, so when you get home and you go back to your job yeah. on Monday, uh, I mean, what, are, what are some of the things you're uh, hiding from yourself that you I'll know you, you don't know? Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, that's a great question. What, okay, before you can even take that next step, I think you need to understand what your values are, your personal values. So you guys want like an action item? Do this. Write a bunch of, here's your, six, here's your six categories, and they're just coming off the top of my head. Your health, okay? Your job, your work, your family, your sex life, your relationships. Um, 
That's about good. I may have missed a few, missed a few of those. Write the two most important things for all five of those things, okay? Be brutally honest. And then those are your values, okay? Now think about those values, think about what you're afraid of, and then optimize your life for those values. And go after them, right? Like for your work especially or for your family too. I mean, sometimes people make this, and it's not me to say, you know, what's more valuable or whatnot, but I've done this, and I, but I'll write like five in each category of what's really important to me. Oh, spirituality actually is, an, is the one I left out. That's really, that's an important part, you know, whatever religion you are or non-religion or whatever, and spirituality could be even your value system on what you think. So that's, there's a practical pro tip that you can do if you want some work, if you want homework. I didn't, I, anyway, okay, no more questions? All right, you guys were awesome. Namaste, take care.